HD based approach to clustering. So we said uh, one way to look at clusters in terms of uh, a probable distribution function is to look at points of high density. So wherever you have a cluster, uh, you have points in a high density. And uh, there are two ways to approach the problem of density, how to you know uh, evaluate density, but we'll see that later. The first way which we'll be exploring now is to uh, approximate the density, uh, model the density using a probability density function. Uh, let me just one second. That we'll approximate it using the probability density function or a PDF. <coughs> we'll just call it, call it P of x or P1 of x. Right, in such a way that when the data points evaluated and on that function, uh, they'll have high values. What that means is the data points belong to that probability density function of the PDF. So if you fit uh, not a single, uh, so a PDF which has multiple peaks, right, uh, to a data set like that, then each of these peaks uh, corresponds to a cluster. So the high density points, that is the peaks in the PDF, correspond to cluster. So this is an intuitive idea. Uh, so we can apply this to data sets, and we talked about this example of uh, this old faithful geezer data, right? So if you have this data has two clean clusters, and you can fit uh, to Gaussians. The Gaussian is a very good example of, of a PDF. <clears throat> so then uh, with some training, so I'll talk about how to train later. With some training, these two Gaussians slowly move towards the clusters, and the Gaussian sections in 2D are ideally ellipses, which can even have some orientation and may not be parallel to the <clears throat> axis, the x and y axis. So after some training, they become they, they are able to capture the two clusters quite effectively. Right, is another animation animated uh, view of the same thing. <clears throat> let us see how to do that. So before we even do that, let us just uh, brush up a few basics. You know, might have learned about Gaussians. <clears throat> in your earlier uh, classes. So Gaussian in simple terms can be written as e power minus x squared. But <clears throat> if you want to have a PDF representing, uh, Gaussian representing a PDF, then a PDF will always uh, have the property of uh, the area under the curve being equal to one, right? So for this to happen, then you need to have uh, certain factors and all that. And also the Gaussian has a centroid. <clears throat> so P of X uh, will have actually P of uh, X uh, and an X bar, which is centroid, and the sigma, which is a sign deviation, or the width of the Gaussian. So with all this, then how do you make sure that uh, the area under the curve in integral of PDX is equal to one? So for that, there is a standard form uh, of Gaussian, which is given by P of X is equal to one by <clears throat> root of two pi sigma square. So sigma square is under the root, so actually you can take it out of the root and just make it sigma, but uh, we'll do it like this. <coughs> then times e power minus uh, X minus X bar whole square by two sigma square. Right, so and in, the, in this case, you can show that integral p of x dx is equal to one. So as you can see in this case, uh, x is a real number, okay, x is a real number. And uh, such a distribution is called a univariate, okay, Gaussian distribution. Yeah, because because it depends upon a single variable. But in general, we'll be dealing with uh, multiple variables. So we'll deal, deal with multivariate distributions. So how what is the expression for a multivariate Gaussian or a normal? Distribution. Uh, so the general expression for that is given by this slightly complicated expression like this. One by 
टू पाई फोर एन बाई टू सो मल्टी सॉरी सो मल्टीवेरियट डायमेंशन इज एन सो एक्स इज एन आर एन सो दिस इज दट एन टाइम्स दे इज अ मेट्रिक्स कॉल एप्सिलॉन दिस पावर दिस मॉट डिप्रेजेंट्स द डिटर्मिनेंट एंड पावर हाफ ओके एंड ई पावर माइनस एक्स माइनस न्यू transpose times is epsilon inverse times x minus mu okay so this expression it looks uh, slightly complicated let me unpack it for you and try to make sense out of out of why it is like that now x and mu are also in rn okay mu is the mean right of the of the distribution this epsilon is a matrix uh, so that is in our n by n it's n by n matrix and it is basically the covariance matrix that means epsilon ij is given as covariance of xi xj which is basically the expected value of x minus uh sorry um <clears throat> so x minus mu <clears throat> x i minus mu i Times x j minus uh, mu j. Okay, so th this is covariance. That is uh, the difference of the variable of the ith component from the mean ith ith component of the mean times the difference of the uh, jth component from its mean. Okay, so this product, if we take expected value of it, that is, I take average over all the samples. Right, that is the ith uh, element of the epsilon matrix. now what you have here in this expression here is the inverse of that okay so it looks uh, pretty complicated now let us see why and how we get that so let us take the example of a uh, uh, gaussian with two variables so x is in r2 okay as an example let's see how we get that so we have two variables x1 and x2 both are in both are real numbers okay so that is uh, x is equal to x1 comma x2 then uh, we'll assume that x1 is is comes from a normal distribution okay with mean value mu1 and standard deviation so this uh, n stands for normal distribution then similarly x2 is also a normal distribution so with the uh, mean value mu2 and standard deviation sigma2 so if that is the case then we have two uh, gaussians so that is i'll call this equal to p1 of x and so uh, sorry uh, p of x1 and this is equal to p of x2 both are gaussians now my final distribution which is a joint distribution of x1 comma x2 x1 and x2 i assume that uh, x1 and x2 are independent so therefore this is equal simple law of you know, independent variables the two probabilities simply become product the joint distribution will be equal to the product of the probabilities if that that is the case then so each of these uh, expressions p of x1 p of x2 will be 
like this expression, <clears throat> the univariate uh, normal distribution. So if you take that and then uh, multiply the two expressions, you get one by root two pi sigma one squared times e to the minus x1 minus mu1 squared by 2 sigma 1 squared times 1 by root 2 pi sigma 2 squared times e power minus x2 minus mu2 squared by 2 sigma 2 squared. Right? So this is what you will get. So if you group them together, you will get something like 1 by uh, 2 pi. So root 2 pi times root 2 pi. So that will be like uh, 2 by 2, OK? Uh, because it's square of this, this quantity. And then you will also have 1 by uh, sigma 1 square times sigma 2 square also power half. Okay. Then you have the exponential term I'll write here but because there's no space here. So e power minus x1 minus mu1 whole square by 2 sigma 1 square minus x2 minus mu2 whole square by 2 sigma 2 square. Okay, so uh, so now let us start putting together and the whole expression in vector terms. So I'll call x is equal to x1, x2 as a column vector. And the vector mu, which is a mean vector, consists of mu1 and mu2. And the I define the matrix epsilon as sigma 1 square 0 0 <coughs> sigma 2 square if, if this is epsilon then we can see that epsilon inverse will be 1 by sigma 1 square 0 0 1 by sigma 2 square right um, So let us so so with these things, let us consider what is uh, determinant. There's a determinant of epsilon, which is which is same as uh, this is equal to sigma one square times sigma two square. So this this we know, and let us look at this big expression which is x minus mu transpose epsilon inverse times x minus mu. Because this is what we had uh, in this uh, big expression. x minus mu transpose epsilon inverse times x minus mu. So that, uh, so we have taken two variables. <coughs> and, we, and right now we have an expression which looks like this. We would like to show that this expression works out to this expression. So if you uh, no, expand this, you will get uh, x minus mu transpose times epsilon inverse will be something like x minus mu1 um, by sigma1 square comma x minus mu2 by sigma2 square Okay, this is a row, mat row matrix, and this will be multiplied by x1 minus mu1, x2 minus mu2 in the column matrix. You now do a dot product of these two vectors. You will simply get x1 minus mu1 whole square 
by sigma 1 square plus x2 minus sigma 2 whole square by sigma 2 square. Okay, so, so if you plug this into here, sorry, I have, there must be a half here. So if I plug this back into the big expression, right, you can show very easily that the P of X now for two dimensions is of the form one by two pi power N by two times mod epsilon okay, power. So this is mod epsilon. So since you need to have sigma one, sigma two, you take a square root of that times e power minus r times <clears throat> vector x minus mu transpose times epsilon inverse. Okay, so this is the expression. <clears throat> so we have derived this by assuming that the individual variables x1 and x2 are uh, like the independently like normal distributions and they're also independent with each other. Therefore, we assume that the joint distribution is equal to the product of the two probability distributions, P1, P of x1 times P2, P of x2. So then we just uh, kind of manipulated the expression to sh and showed and have shown that uh, the final expression is of this form. So now, so what is our goal now? We need to fit such expressions to clusters. So this, so if you have clusters in n dimensions, we need to fit such Gaussians for these clusters. Okay, so that means since in any given data set, you will have multiple clusters, you need to fit multiple Gaussians. So what that means is you need to fit a combination of Gaussians, some kind of a linear, linear sum of Gaussians. You cannot obviously manage with a single Gaussian. So this is the whole object of the problem. That is uh, how to fit a given data set using the linear sum of Gaussians. So let me write it down. How to fit a data set using a linear sum of Gaussians. Why do you want to do that? Because once we are able to fit it, and we have to justify that that fit is in some sense optimal. That is the best fit for the, for the data set. Then each Gaussian is like a cluster. And the, uh, so once you have do the, uh, done that, uh, each Gaussian is like a cluster, right? And the mu of the Gaussian, the mean of the Gaussian is like the centroid. Uh, centroid and the sigma of the Gaussian is like the uh, width or size of the cluster and so on and so forth. So, so that is the intuitive idea behind this. Okay, so the the expression that we will be trying to we will be trying to fit to the data set this is what we call this linear sum of Gaussians is actually more formally called a, this linear sum of Gaussians is more formally called a mixture a mixture of Gaussians <clears throat> and such a model is called a, a Gaussian mixture model. Okay, GMF. And the expression for that is given by okay, so P of uh, P of X given a bunch of parameters. These parameters are denoted by the same symbol, which is like capital theta. Uh, so this is it's a linear sum of Gaussians. I'll just say sum or alpha 
uh, i p i of x this small theta theta i subscript so i goes from 1 to k so what is going on so each of this is a gaussian and theta i corresponds to mu i and uh, sigma i <clears throat> and alpha i is the weightage now why do we need a weightage can't we just add up a bunch of gaussians so anybody can can anybody answer that why do we need these alphas can't i just add up a bunch of gaussians and get a gaussian mixture model can somebody answer that hello people awake is it because of the different I think, uh, sorry because of the different distributions are weighted differently yeah um yes. and anybody else if i just add up gaussian there'll be a violation of some basic principle what is the principle that is violated so what you said is right i mean because so if i have a data set like this i have small number of points here and large number of points here right if i'm fitting it using two gaussian i can't have like an you know, equal size gaussian representing both so i cannot just add up two identical gaussians right it should be something like a small gaussian for this and a big gaussian for this. so that can only be captured by a weightage that is right but if i just add up two gaussians like that what will happen so i'll just say p of x is equal to p1 of x plus p2 of x right now p1 and p2 are independently gaussians so what's wrong with this it may not add up to one ah very good Thank so you. the basic property of any pdf right for any pdf integral p of x dx is equal to 1 so if these two independently integrate to 1 the area under the curve is 1 then obviously there is a violation so at least for that reason you need to have some kind of weightages okay but more importantly you need to have weightages to to indicate the size of the cluster right how big is the cluster okay so uh, so therefore we will use an expression like this right a weighted sum of gaussians weighted by alphas now um, so generally whenever we we do a fit right we always express the outcome of the fit in terms of some kind of a cost function right so for example if you fit a bunch of data points using a straight line right you say there is a cost function that is the error between the actual curve and the data points right is is supposed to minimize so that you know this is for you to defend some kind of regression error and then you say minimize e right so error will be here uh, uh, like you know the expected value of y times you know the the sum of all the all data points it will be something like this and that you minimize and then you get uh, your your answer the answer is what is slope of the line and what is the intercept so in this case what will be such cost function which we will try to minimize or maximize or whatever just to indicate that uh, the level of the quality of the fit of the pdf to the data anybody any guesses so let me build some intuitive arguments then we'll make it more mathematically more formal so like i always say so in fact uh, when i studied this algorithm like way back when i was student i never understood what the hell was, was going on but about a few years ago when i started studying it uh, and teaching it by my, to you know, by myself to to myself then i found certain simple way of understanding it and after that i'm very comfortable this is actually a very simple idea but people use lot of mathematical jargon and you know notation and make it very complicated so let me ask you so i have a data point okay i have a single tiny little data point and then i want to fit a gaussian to this now consider two cases 
Gauss line is right on top of the data point. This is one case. The other case, the Gaussian is here and the data point. Oh no, uh, the Gaussian is here and data point is here. So, okay. So, in the second case, data point is in the same location. Gaussian is somewhere else. Okay, so which is a better fit, do you, do you think? Case one or case two? Anybody? Is, is the question, does the question make sense? I have a data set, I'm fitting a Gaussian to it, single Gaussian, not a mixture. All right, and uh, here is a data point. And let us say data point is at uh, origin and goes in mean also happens to be at origin in the first case. Second case, the data point is again at the origin, but the goes in mean happens to be at say five. Okay, so this is five and this is zero. This is zero. In which case is the fit uh, better? In which case is the Gaussian representing the data point effectively? First one. Hello. Yeah, first. Yeah, first one. Right. It's intuitive, very obvious, yeah. right? Yeah. So let me then ask you a slightly different next question, more complicated question. I have two data points. Um, well, let me ask you the same question. Mathematically, how would you how would you justify your answer? What is going on? What did you do to make this decision? So the Gaussian has a function, it's a P of X. Now, what did you do to say that uh, this is a better fit than this? We said, like, since we have only one point, we assumed like that one point having the highest um, P of X would be the best for Yeah, the so that basically is. the data point I'll say is XJ. There's a notation for data, right? If I, P, of, P of X is a function, if I evaluate P at XJ, right, and if I want to say that, like if I want to argue that P of X is a good representation of XJ, what do we expect? P of X when evaluated at XJ should give me a high value. Right, in fact, ideally it should give me the highest value. Then I say that the Gaussian is, like, you know, the function best represents the data point, right? Uh, since, but then the problem is since the Gaussian has only a single P, we need to consider what happens if you have two data points, have two data points. Okay, I need to place a Gaussian. I have only a single Gaussian. So how do you, where do you place data, the Gaussian? <clears throat> In such a way that it represents both data points, I'll call this X1 and X2. Both should be represented effectively. I mean, uh, it has only it, yeah, center the Gaussian around about its mean. Like yeah, so I center it something like this. So that's the best you can do. Okay, so then P of X1 is fairly high. P of X2 is also high. Right? Now, these are all still somewhat loose arguments. How do I pose it mathematically? Okay, so this is a great problem. That is, if I if you can answer it with two points and one Gaussian, you are done. Everything else is detailed. You follow the same pattern. Uh, when you have two points and you have only one Gaussian, you evaluate the Gaussian at x1 and x2. And what do you want to maximize? P of x1 plus P of x2. Okay, P of x1 plus P of x2, or is it something else? Uh, You're almost there. Sorry. Yeah. P of X one into P of X two. I'm guessing then. Perfect. Yeah. P of X one into P of X two. So we want it to be high for both X one and X two. Okay. So it should be high for both. So in this case, we are just moving the Gaussian around. Okay. We are not changing its shape. 
so kind of i'm assuming that i'm only i've only control over its mean that is the mu mu value okay uh, in general you can also vary the sigma, sigma but anyway to keep it keep the argument simple i'm only moving it around so what i want is i wanted to have high evaluations at x1 and x2 so my the product of all the evaluation should be highest so this is the uh, this is the requirement right so the best fit is one where so at best fit means uh, this quantity p of x1 times p of x2 times p of x capital n because the n data points this quantity must be maximum okay um, right maximize this now so in this argument since we are just making some preliminary arguments uh, i've just uh, assumed that p of x is p is is a gaussian but in general you are not fitting you know going to fit a single gaussian you are going to fit a mixture of gaussians right so assume that uh, in general right in general p of x is a gmm gaussian mixture model uh, then again same thing is the argument is same the principle is same whether p of x is single gaussian or a gaussian mixture model what we mean by a good fit is the gaussian mixture function when evaluated at all the data points the product of all those probabilities should be maximum it is a pretty scary requirement but we will try to you know, suppose some somehow simplify it so what that means is i have uh, so like you know pi which is pi stands for the product okay not Not the pi value of p x j um, should be maximized, and this quantity is so. This p of x j, sorry, <clears throat> so p of x j has some parameters. So I'll just simply denote them as. This big theta. It has lots of parameters. I'll just put them in big theta. So all this is denoted by a function called L, which is uh, given by. So what is L now? D is the data set, which is x1 to xn. Okay, theta. This big theta is is all the params. So you multiply the evaluations of p at x j, where p is a function of all the lots of parameters, right? And uh, this j goes from one to n. This quantity is called the likelihood. That's why I use the notation notation L here. Likelihood. what is likelihood the likelihood that this data set d comes from the distribution p all right that's what it means <clears throat> okay so we are trying to maximize the likelihood this is a problem now okay so which means what do you do the all the parameters which we can tweak to maximize this l are all inside here somewhere very deeply buried and not only that uh, and gaussian is a very painful expression right i mean your parameters like uh, sigmas and all are very deeply buried and it's not easy to just differentiate it and then set it to zero and solve for it. not only that there is a added dimension to the coming there is a problem because here this all these terms are involve a product and not a sum Had it been a sum, we can independently differentiate them and uh, set them to zero. But because it's a product, it's even more painful. Because the product rule for differentiation is, you know, is very painful, right? Not like the product rule for the rule for addition. 
So, so what people have done to avoid this uh, this problem of these painful products is they converted this into a summation by taking a log on both sides. Okay, so log of L. So now that becomes a summation. Okay, so which is I mean, a lot, lot more peaceful. And uh, this expression is denoted by some kind of a more fancy wiggly L, uh, D. Okay, what is this expression called? I mean, quite intuitively it is called a log likelihood. Right, and this expression has to be maximized. Nice thing about a log, it not only converts products into sums, since log is a, or here we're using a long, okay, is a monotonic function. And therefore, a maximum of a function, right, uh, if you take, even if you take a log, the new function also will have the maximum at the same point, because it's a, it's a, it's a monotonic function, right? Okay, so we'll try to maximize this log likelihood expression. So now that is uh, this L of D is equal to long Okay, is equal to sum log within this now we use the full expression of P where we had alpha i e i x uh, x j times now we use small theta i. So I goes from one to K. Okay, now here the PI is again a uh, Gaussians. And the theta I is uh, mu I and, and uh, epsilon I, because now these are all and multivariate Gaussians in general. Okay, so you see that the expression is quite quite complicated. But uh, the actual learning rule, so now the, we're trying to maximize this whole thing, which means, oops, maximize this whole thing, which means uh, what, are, what, do, what can you tweak to maximize this? Basically, you have only three kinds of parameters, the alphas, the weightages, the means of the Gaussians, mu i's, and this covariance matrices signals okay so if you can uh, we need to tweak them we need to find out what they are right so the so as to maximize this expression you know, then you are done you got, you got the answer um so that's what we'll do all right i think let's take a break uh, because it's a slightly heavy heavy class i would like you to kind of chew on this a little bit and get used to the concepts Right, then once you have the basic idea, it's very easy to differentiate this and you know get some expressions and all that's very easy. But I want you to get used to this this way of looking at the clustering problem because this is a very very well known uh, technique in in statistical pattern recognition you know, area. Right, so let us uh, take a break here. Next class, what we will do is that is on Friday. So what mm -hmm. we'll do is then. I'll solve this for uh, the various cases, but starting with the uni univariate case, which is simple as univariate and a single Gaussian. This is a, this is a mixture of the Gaussian has only a single Gaussian. 
All right, then we'll take uh, univariate case, but mixture has multiple coefficients, and so on and so forth. We'll take uh, progressively more and more complex cases and show that the final expression that you get to train or to update this alpha i, mu i, and epsilon i has very interesting similarities to fuzzy logic or fuzzy cluster. So, I mean, obviously, from a mathematical point of view, from the point of view of motivations, fuzzy clustering and this algorithm have nothing to do with each other, at least apparently. But the reason, and, uh, but they actually, but there are deep connections between the two. And that's the reason I have chosen to introduce this topic right after fuzzy clustering, because you can make the connection between the two and you can understand this algorithm intuitively by using the fuzzy clustering as a prop. Right, so and that we can derive, you know, pretty uh, naturally, very systematically. So, uh, any questions?